you allow me just a few seconds just to say thank you so much, Michael Lowe here. How do you pronounce your name? Lowe, the German way or Lowe, the American way? You got to unmute, Mike. Michael, your microphone is muted. I'm not sure if you can hear us. Your microphone is muted. <laughs> the <laughs> microphone. My department chair is Kevin Lowe. And so he pronounces his name Lowe, but um, as someone who lived in Germany for many years, I know it's a German name, Lowe, which means lime, right? Yeah. So, uh, so I never my, knew my, how to pronounce it. Bottom, bottom left corner, you got to hit uh, um, unmute. Cool. There you go. Okay. okay. We're up and running. Yeah. Yep, I just have to connect my ears again. It's always something going wrong with me. One minute. Seems to be working now. Yeah, have you met before? You, you We've have, you have, emails, you have but we haven't met before. But as I said, once I saw the name of the company, I was instantly intrigued because, as I said, it's one of those products that sort of everybody knows that you can eat them. But I have no idea. Well, I, I do. I know what truffles are. But I bet most people don't know if it's a plant, if it's a mushroom, if it's a some synthesized things. So it just seems like such an interesting product. And then obviously wine, everybody loves wine. So it seems like a good idea. So, um, so I see we have uh, quite a few students and more are coming. So uh, while we are working out the technology, I guess uh, we will follow the usual script, maybe a quick introduction and then questions and answers. Uh, Professor Gordon, uh, not monitored as the name of the account, uh, Perchhold, uh, so he's Canadian, but he's currently in Singapore. So he is the professor who put us in touch with the company as well as with several other companies. And he's also very heavily involved in Excultures administrative efforts as well as strategic planning, especially on the strategic front. Uh, so plus one unique thing about the professor here is, if you already noticed, we have a, a wonderful collection of instructional videos uh, called the Excalibur Matrix series. But it's not your regular lectures that you would see from professors. It's a specifically focused series of videos on how the academic world is different from the real world. And Professor Perchhold knows something about the real world most of his life. He has been a global partner at one of the biggest consulting companies, uh, Deloitte. So it's basically one of the big three globally. So he, for a living, was basically working with the companies and uh, helping them uh, succeed in the marketplace. And so now he's in academia, but he knows both worlds. And uh, he argues that the real world is a little different from the academic world. And so he took the time over the summer to record a series of about a dozen lectures that help you um, basically do consulting the way the real world expects you to do it. So I recommend that you take a look at those videos. Um, and I guess today he will be running the show. So I'll, I'll go in the background. Thank you so much, Gordon and Michael. So all yours. Okay, great, Vass. Thank you for that. Um, and I, I do want to welcome the students of x uh, as you, what I'd say, into the fascinating world of truffles, which, you know, to me, as soon as I heard about truffles, I've been thinking of a high-end culinary experience of France What's it doing in Australia? Um, so it, it should be an interesting uh, challenge for you to consider. Um, quick background, yes, as Vass said, I'm now an associate professor at SMU, Singapore Management University, um, after obtaining a PhD in international management. So uh, I did that at the late end of my career. Um, and it does give me a bit, bit, bit different perspective. Um, I would encourage you to watch the Matrix series. Um, bas basically, it's gonna help you survive when you start your job. Um, and some of the things are just even for the X culture to know how to write an executive summary. Um, if you also want some more information about, uh, and some of you are taking international management courses, you're welcome to follow me on LinkedIn because my course is actually being delivered through LinkedIn. Uh, uh, so if we just sim simply search for a name on LinkedIn, will it give us the correct link or should, should do you want to provide uh, the link? Yeah. You know, there's only six Perchholds in the world. Now, my last name is P, you, you know, you, can you just uh, send on chat by uh, spelling on my last name? Oh, I'll tell you, it's perch as in, uh, as in the fish, T, hold. Okay, you look, you put perch all in, you, nah, I'm, I'm the only one that will show up. <laughs> Much better right, than um, Yes, so I, I do follow um, um, uh, Gordon's uh, LinkedIn account. So he posts pretty frequently, almost every day, interesting stuff related to international business. So if you are into business in general, consulting, international business, I think it's just a useful account to, to be associated with. So I highly yeah. recommend. So the, some of you may not know that the Truffle Wine Company is based in Western Australia, which is on the 
far east side of the beautiful Margaret River wine region. And it's a great, great wine region known for their quality Cabernets. Uh, in a small town called Manjermuk. And that's a challenge with all the town names in Australia. Well They're Aboriginal origins. This one means edible root of the bulrush at watering place. Which, being an edible root, I thought, wow, that's a quite, a, quite, quite a, an appropriate uh, town for your business to be in, given that truffles are cultivated on roots. So Michael Lowe is the uh, general manager of Truffle and Wine Company. He's contributed his efforts to uh, write your challenge uh, document, which Vast commented that came, came across as a nature documentary. Uh, and so you do have a, a, a good author uh, potential there. Um, and he's going to describe to you the, uh, the challenge today. So welcome, Michael. Glad you could Thank join you us. Much. Um, first, tell us something about yourself, how you came to work for Truffle Wine uh, Company, and the environment in which your organization operates within. Okay, well, I came to the Truffle Wine Company about uh, just over, well, coming up five years now. Um, my background is I've got a degree in agriculture. I style myself as a, just a farmer. I'm a fourth generation farmer. Uh, we have our own, I've got my own farming properties elsewhere. And also I've been involved in business. Uh, I was involved in finance. I did a stint in a suit, which was good fun. Um, and also I, I ran uh, a corporation, uh, myself and a partner, we ran a John Deere dealership in our Eastern Wheat Belt. Um, I bring that to notice because when we talk about the truffle industry per se, you know, you'd say the industry in Australia is, is an emerging industry. And you think about agribusiness, you think about big time business, but agriculture in well, the truffles in agriculture is actually very small. Still, I have owned and run businesses with annual turnovers greater than the whole Southern hemisphere turnover in truffles in terms of fresh truffle. So I'll bring, park that and we'll come back to that a little bit later on. But fundamentally I've had a background in, in growing stuff um, with viticulture, wheat and the like. Ventures which I've owned myself, uh, my money at risk. Um, I can tell you I've made uh, a lot of mistakes. Fortunately I've only made the same mistake once uh, and none of them have been have been terminal, but uh, I do come from an academic background. The way I attack things, um, and as Gordon has said, it's a great deal of difference between the way you read about how something can be done and the actual the execution of it in the real world it can be totally different things. So that's a little bit about me. The industry itself, the truffle industry, is crazy. There's more myth and magic around fresh truffles than any other industry you've ever come across. You can read the deep dark secrets of the, the cash truffle trade in Europe. You can talk about the ways that uh, they try to um, introduce cheap Chinese truffle into the European truffle mix, mix them all up in a bag. So this is truffle which is worth cents a kilo as opposed to thousands of dollars a kilo. You mix it up in a plastic bag with real truffle, the proper aromic truffle, shake it all around, put a little synthetic aroma in it, and then you go and portray that as being worth very, very expensive truffle. All of these things have, uh, you can say they're in the past, but that's not so dis distance past. The way that worked in Europe was that the people would go out and grab truffle pretty well in the season from, from December through to uh, February. And they'll be going out to taking the truffle to the restaurants. And that would be just something like myself going out with my dog, finding some truffle and taking it to a restaurant and selling it direct. I thought it was pigs and then you get truffles. Uh, yes, but pigs love truffle. They love truffle. So trying to keep a 150 kilo sow away from its favorite treat. Um, and they said, how many years you've been hunting truffle? Uh, five. Um, <laughs> so people generally have uh, lost a finger or two trying to keep the treats. Okay. But the truffle was primarily, the whole industry was orientated around Europe, uh, France, Italy, um, and Northern Hemisphere. And what we've done now, if we've, we've uh, introduced a whole new 
gambit into it because we are actually producing truffle outside of season, what was traditionally for season, for the way that the, the products were presented to restaurants. So it's been, uh, we've given a fresh product or fresh truffle is now available from uh, pretty well from January, uh, sorry, from June, July, August, plus or minus a couple of weeks. And then December, January, February, plus or minus a couple of weeks. And that's where the fresh truffle season works. In Europe, there used to be thousands of kilos of truffle, hundreds of kilos of truffle of being consumed, produced and consumed each year. And then a number of things have come about that's actually decimated the, the truffle world in the, in the wild forage sense before we started putting things into orchards. Uh, world War I wiped out huge areas. Um, and then World War II wiped out huge areas of trees, of oaks. There was uh, uh, another thing where there was uh, trees where um, uh, you had grapevines with phylloxera um, and those properties became overrun with weeds and then the, the, orchard, the surrounding uh, native forests were also overrun with weeds. So production's gone down. We've also had pollution. Truffles are a fungi. They're very, very susceptible to pollution. They need clean air, clean water to be able to grow. Um, so production has dropped down. And then in Australia pops up and we've decided we're going to go and grow truffle. But we're not growing any truffle. We're actually growing the Perigold French truffle. And the Perigold French truffle is the second most expensive truffle in the world outside of the Italian Alba. The way it was done was the scientists in Australia was, were studying nutritional effects on tree roots for a whole range of reasons. And mycorrhiza wrap themselves around a tree root and enable the tree to extract more nutrients, more water out of the soil. And in return for that, it's a symbiotic relationship, in return for that, the tree goes and gives sugars, gives um, carbon. So the truffle itself becomes a carbon sink and it's a symbiotic relationship. You give me some water and I'll give you some, some sugars. Um, and that's pretty well the way that, that, it, that it works. But we're trying to do work in Australia in a very arid soils and bringing mycorrhiza species from around the world, this is all very science, mycorrhiza species around the world and grow them on jarrah trees, on gum trees, on any sort of tree to enable the tree to extract better nutrition from the soil. One smart fellow decided that why don't we look at actually growing the truffles ourselves and he did work which on things called bioclines. He looked in Europe and said these are the best places in the world where truffles are grown, well are the best places in Australia where truffles can be grown and that's how he's identified the areas and particularly this area in Manjum up in Western Australia to actually grow the truffle. Now that sounds fantastic, this is a, but this is a very long bow to take. So this is right at the start when we're starting to learn about how you inoculate, not just plant a tree in the ground and in a natural truffle occurring tree soils um, in Europe. So what he's done is we've, we've now had to inoculate the soil, inoculate the seed and change the soil as well. We had to change the soil pH, we put a lot of lime on, a few other things. And then they put this tree in the ground and they waited and they waited <laughs> and they waited. It was a pure leap of faith. So after six years, they found their first truffle and that was a 168 gram truffle over 21 hectares, over 50 acres of truffle trees, one truffle. If you want to convert it back to uh, per kilo rate, that truffle was worth between 25 and $30 million US a kilo, based oh, on what they invested. <laughs> yeah, oh, it's crazy. So we've gone from that to, and it's a very small jump, 22 years later, where we're sending thousands of kilos of truffle overseas, to the top Michelin star restaurants around the world. So our company was the Australian truffle industry. Other people have come in behind us and they are more plantings and more plantings of, of trees. But it takes four years to actually find a truffle these days and your first planting. 
people say, oh, you can make money by the time you get to year seven, but that's not the case. It doesn't work that way. You, you, you would be battling to get to break even between year 12 and year 14. And then after that, it's good. It's, it's, it's a, it goes up in terms of production. And then you get to a mature production up here and it just levels off. And with good management, we have to be able to extend the, the productive life of the orchard to 40 to 50 years. Okay, so, you, so, so, so you've been, been able to produce something unique in Australia. Yes. Why, why do, you know, as Aussies, they just eat meat pies and sausage rolls. Uh, you know, th this is a culinary delight. Why would you uh, produce these? Look, again, it's the, the, the characters that it's, and then bear in mind that the original, the guys originally put their money into this project are still in there. Okay. So these were very successful businessmen and I, I'd hate to say, but this is a bit of play money. Mm -hmm. it, it was as though a successful businessman in their in their uh, there must have 50s. been miners in Western Australia. <laughs> yes, yeah. So they've but they all love their food. They love the wine. They love the food. Um, uh, they, that was their passion. It was quite you know, quite amazing characters to meet. So is it um, sold in, in Australia or where, where you know what countries do you already sell the product to? Okay, so it's grown now to where we sell. Uh, truffle into we've got 14 distributors worldwide uh, we'd go between 25 and 35 40 countries some years depending on what the demand was um, there used to be a thing called cruise ships we used to supply a lot of cruise ships luxury luxury um, events on on big ocean liners um, but this year obviously it's been a it's been a crazy year in terms of uh, the covid but we used to be able to brag that we were 48 hours paddock to plate anywhere in the world. Um, so we would have... A bit of the spoilage. Like you got yes. 14 days or whatever. Yeah, so the, the, the life of the truck, ideally you, you get it out of the ground. Um, we try to give you that as short as possible. So we say we're two days, get it to you. And then you've got pretty well 14 days under good conditions. Some people are able to keep the truffle a little bit longer depending on how they store it but you got to say you got to use it within 14 days and certainly using it within seven days is about the best timeline 10 7 to 10 days and when you say that you know, you're, you're, you're selling it it's mainly the europe though still is it or and these these are the no, the no. truffles not not the value added product no this is not the value added this is just where it started so when we originally we our brag was we were actually selling truffles back to french truffles back to france which was pretty cool. Um, and certainly Europe and, and France is still one of our major, our, our major markets. Um, but we are, we are worldwide. So um, you'd say in five years ago, about a third of our product was going into Europe, about a third was going into Northern America and about a third was going into, uh, into Asia and about 10% consumption within Australia. And that numbers might be plus or minus 5%. You know, it might be up to 15% in Australia, depending on the year. But we, we were going internationally and we were, we opened up markets. And the way we opened up markets was, we thought, oh, look, we're producing truffle and everybody loves truffle and all the top chefs want truffle. So they, they want, their, want our truffle. But the problem was all the menus on truffle were Northern Hemisphere menus, which were based around um, winter foods because it's historically been eaten in January, February, you know, December, January, February. So we had to go out and convince chefs, one, we had to produce great, we were producing a great product, but two, how do you use this in a summer menu? And so we actually provided, a, we did a lot of marketing. We got, we got top chefs on board. We, we, we pretty well gave them some truffle to play with and say, come on, see what you can do with this in, a summer menu and then we started grab growing some traction and we had to we had to start doing that out in front of our production we couldn't actually wait for ourselves to start producing and then go and grow the market yeah. it, it wasn't going to work because the the way the truffles went when they started producing they went from oh look you've got 10 kilos this year next year you've got a hundred the year after you've got a thousand so you can't just wait for the market we actually had to work out in front of the market 
And once we got to that initial foothold, we are then able to leverage with our chef ambassadors up into Hong Kong, up into Singapore. Chefs generally don't respect boundaries. They have, they'll be involved in restaurants in different countries. So, and everyone looks over the fence, as a farmer would say, look over the fence to see what the neighbor's doing. And they say, oh, you've got truffles in the middle of July. Oh, that's fantastic. I wish I had those. So we're able to build with the chef ambassadors, building their profile and uh, with, with people like uh, Bombana, uh, Thomas Keller, uh, goes on and on, you can see from our material we provided, but we've got some fantastic chefs on our, on our list. So, so you have, you, this is all around the, the actual truffle and your distributors. Yes. The actual challenge is around the value-added product. Uh, and That's actually, right. Is it the same distributor for the truffle as for the value-added product or are they different distributors? No, it's, 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 uh, it's a crazy thing. In Europe, the majority of the truffle that comes out of the ground, they've got a very high uh, attrition rate in terms of the quality. So we're the other way around. We've got a very high portion of our truffle would be called a chef grade. The grade below that, which goes into the gourmet products, we don't have not been producing enough of it. It's only now as our production is getting to grow, we've got a, a base amount of this uh, industrial or cooking truffle, which we can put into a volume of gourmet products, which we can then sell. Before we're selling all of this industrial, this cooking truffle was going back into France, it was being processed in, in, by French manufacturers and it was going out as product of France because the amount of truffle mass that goes into these products is only half to up to 3%. So, so they didn't need very much. So your strategy is to add value to that industrial rather than just ship a, That's a, right. a raw material. And that. Yes, yes. And is, yeah. the, is the target market for that again France or is this going to be, I, th I think it's more Asia? It's, I'd say it's more Asia for us. Um, and we've done some, some little steps in that direction already. Because it's a European food, uh, a lot of the, the foods it's going into, or the gourmet product lines, the value-added products, are actually going into European-type flavours in, in terms of... And some of those can be, a, can be adapted or in, in introduced into um, Asian-type cuisines. But what we're seeing is that the, in Europe, it's very much an established, um, it was an established product and people know it. And the, the amount of the gourmet products that get consumed in Europe is, is, is huge. And it's actually, they don't actually produce enough. And that's where they come to us to buy our industrial to take to Europe to continue to produce enough. So then they have an opportunity to be able to take stuff internationally. Yeah. So although there are a number of manufacturers, there are also, uh, it's a big world out there and different people have found their little niches in different markets. So the way that we're looking at it at the moment is we think that we're trying to be introduce our products into Asian cuisine. We're doing it by the way we've done some, some collaborative work with a couple of uh, uh, master chefs, one, uh, one particular guy in, um, in Vietnam, where we produced a little series of uh, videos on using our product in Vietnamese food or in Asian cuisine, um, using uh, truffled, uh, truffled honey with duck, um, using uh, a Himalayan salt, um, truffled salt in with a, um, a prawn dish. Um, so we're, we're, we're experimenting with, we've, we've, again, we've done what we did with our, our truffle, our fresh truffle, is we've taken our samples, our, our products, and we've given it to chefs and said, I don't know how you can make this. This is how we do it in, with a European cuisine. How about you try it in something that you want to try? Okay, Have a so play. You you're getting these celebrity uh, chefs to basically endorse by using it and hoping that someone will watch that YouTube or whatever, or how, how, how do you get it out there that people understand that? That's yeah. So, so this is all preliminary work. we we, it's, it's part of our initial stepping out of seeing whether there is, there is a market for our, or there is, there is the flavor profile in our offering to attract people. And then, we're still limited. Um, we've got a couple of things, it was real chicken and egg sort of things happening at the moment. 
we are a very small company, despite our prestige and our standing in terms of fresh production. Mm -hmm. We are very small. Um, but we have something here which could effectively give us the growth in our business by getting this value added product out there. So I'm very, I've been stepping it out s slowly. We've also, we, part of our, our picture, I suppose, is that all of the truffle that goes into our gourmet products comes from our farm. International manufacturers will source their truffle from hundreds, if not thousands of small sources when they go out and they make their gourmet products. So it goes out under the manufacturer's brand. It doesn't go out under the farmer's brand. And that's our, that's the difference between us and anyone else in the world. It comes so out under the farmer's brand. A wine company to be a brand, branded internationally for high quality uh, value added truffle products. You yes. Know, build that but the, 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 the brand. brand. Yeah, I guess the question is yeah. how do students do that? You've given an example yes. of uh, um, a chef. Now the students shouldn't think that's the only way to get it out no. there. But it's a, it's a crowded space. You go into some of these gourmet shops and you see all these oils and salts and yes. everything. How do you differentiate yourself? That's what we're looking to find out. That, oh. that's, we're, we're, looking, we're looking for some direction in this next step. This, this, is, this is not, we are, the, the timing of this, uh, said Gordon, is just terrific as far as I'm concerned because we are right at the beginning. We were sending all of this truffle mass back over into Europe. This year, we, apart from you know, COVID notwithstanding, we've kept everything. So we're in a position to, to grow our, our product lines. What we don't know is what are the best markets to go into? Should we be aiming simply at chefs and uh, food service? Should we be doing with the change? The world's changed again. The amount of condiments, the sales of condiments worldwide have gone through the roof. And it's because... People are cooking at home, mm. and even even in places like in places like Hong Kong, where you you you'd have a kitchen, but you wouldn't actually cook because it's it's easy to just go out and grab food. It's mm. it's everywhere. It's it's very cheap. That stopped. You can't just go out and do that now. So people are spending more, and and particularly in the middle class, middle and upper class, people are using more cooking at home, and this this is something which can give you a real this, this gives you a bit of difference. This, this is having people actually playing around with cooking again themselves. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're trying to, we're trying to assess where we actually target ourselves. And the same for countries. We do not have, because, because all our supply of truffle comes from our farm or from our little area, we don't have an unlimited amount of these products. We're limited on our production each year. I just can't go down the street and say, oh, I need some more ingredients. I need some more truffle to go into my truffle products. It's not there. So, so you're going to come from our farm. Selective about which uh, countries are the optimal to en enter the, you know, so you can reduce sort of basically disaggregating or, or fragmenting your effort. You want to focus on a couple yes. of key parts. Yeah. Yes. And, and then you have this thing about the, so the, the brand we're building is we, the value added products is called Truffle Hill. So the parent company is Hazel Hill Proprietary Limited. And we own several brands. We market our fresh truffle under the Truffle and Wine Company, but it was set the separate, separate brand, which is Truffle Hill, and that's for the gourmet products. Now, I'll provide the, the, the information on the labels and what they look like. I don't know if that, that label is appropriate for a market such as Japan. I don't know if it's appropriate for the Philippines. I don't know if it's appropriate, you know, in a Chinese market. I don't know. I don't know if we should be, what is the, what will make the point of difference that stands out? I don't know whether we should be going through a whole series of distributors because the fresh distributors are not the ones that deal with dry goods and value added well, products. Yeah, I'm looking at a list of questions from the students. Um, so just to be, just so it's clear to them, uh, you, this challenge is not about how to get the physical truffle out there, the, the high grade truffle. No, you know, no. Uh, it's not how to get the, the value added goods uh, so the 20% of your uh, uh, production that goes into those bottled products around oil, salts, and the like, and yes. get them distributed. So they don't have as much of a shelf life. So your, your truffles have a 14-day shelf life. Your, your, yes. your other products, uh, 
what's the shelf life of them? Well, you're talking of two years. And then there is a truffle jus we do, a truffle juice, and that's got a shelf life of five years. And there's, is, there's no seasonality to it then. Uh, no, that's yeah. right. Yeah, okay. So uh, to, to date, the, the way it seems to have worked, and we've done very well, we've had a little trial from November last year in online sales through a distributor uh, into Taiwan. And that's okay. gone very well, primarily as gifting, as part of the gifting market. And I'm forever amazed of how many gifting opportunities there are across different cultures across the world. So well, this and, becomes and part and of a major, gifting uh, offering. Gifting is such a major component, you know, and in, in Japan, yeah. Korea, all, all the markets, and, and finding something that's unique is, is, yes. is quite, quite interesting. So when we say that's, again, because we've got limited production, you know, one thought was thrown up, should we number every jar? Mm -hmm. <laughs> of a particular run do you have a, a a gold series run for something do you have a a, 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 a particular run just building up into Chinese New Year uh, do, what sort of what's yeah so is our labeling going to be correct do we keep it it seems to be from my hearing from what speaking with different people is that oh yes you need some some orientation towards the local market in which you're trying to work in but because they recognize that yours is a prestigious product, you don't want to change too much. So is it just a matter of having the import sticker on it and that's all you need to do? But how do you actually, you have to be able to get your message across. Um, what sort of dishes, it's okay to buy something. I just don't want people to buy it because of the prestige or well, that's nice, but I actually want them to use it. Yeah. So I also want to have, how do you, how do you get it across the idea of how this gets used in the cuisine, which you're used to, or how you can introduce that little variation to something that might be a staple in your, in your, in your diet or your, Is you know, your normal offering of food. Complimentary aspect to this where you, you know, the people aren't really going to use a truffle oil until they've tried truffle itself. You know, not a lot of people have actually had truffle, particularly in Asia, <laughs> you know, yeah. or you're not too worried about, you think the reputation of the high end, quality of truffle and the luxuriousness of it will transcend having to try it. I, I, I think it's, it's with truffles, it's actually the other way around that in Europe, the gourmet products have actually been the way that they've grown the market in that it's an introduction. The gourmet products have provided an introduction to the flavor. Look, the, the truffle, the gourmet truffles is done with a synthetic aroma. It's, 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 and the trick is to be able to get that balance in the palate that you can get. You can't get the finesse that you get with fresh truffle. The reason you can't use fresh truffle in a number of these products and get the aroma route that way is because of shelf life. And also because there are things, if it goes past that shelf life, you, you've, you've got, you've got a nasty, it's not, it's not good for your health. <laughs> so, you, you're using a synthetic to mimic the flavour. You're adding the, the truffle from our, the, pro, the actual truffle into the product. And then you're presenting this as an introductory thing. I said, the, the one that's gone off actually very, very well is the truffle honey. Hmm. So we've got, a, we've got access to um, a honey that's from the West Australian bush. And it's also, uh, the hives are also placed around um, uh, fruit trees. So you get this, it's a combination of citrus, bush, and uh, plum blossom nectar that's gone into this. It's, it's very, very good. Um, and then we've got another one, which is actually manuka. So we've got an access to manuka honey uh, as well as, a, as an opportunity for building that. So that's, that's as a food product. So it's a, it's a lower grade manuka, but it is still a manuka, can be classified as a manuka honey. So but students honey in, in, in into the challenge document, and it, you have links there that show yes. all these different type of Aliata products. So I have, yes. Dave, Dave, Dave Rincon uh, has a, uh, a question, and I, I, it doesn't pop up which country he's in, uh, but it just wants to make sure, and I think also just to make sure we're clear, you're expecting them to define which country to focus their efforts, define which yes. product to go there uh, and how yes. to introduce your product within that country. Yes. 
And that may mean that also identifying the distributors and uh, retailers or, or uh, uh, the, where to place the product, uh, the marketing yes. for the product, all those elements. So, so there's a lot of talk about you know, uh, is the shop front dead? Is the bricks and mortar dead? Is it going through a, an e-commerce type site? Is that the way to be able to do it? But primarily you have to have profile before people, how will you develop that profile? I've seen some really good marketing that's been done without a shop front. New launch product, purely done through a digital medium because I've been able to market it out through uh, either through an Instagram or WeChat or WhatsApp um, type um, marketing platforms. Um, is that the way to go? What so will work not, in a particular country? The online at this moment, you're going through distributors only. The, the couple you've tried. And yes. I know you're really stages, like Japan, Singapore. Yeah. yeah. yeah so so we, we've, at, at the moment, we're doing, uh, we're looking to redo a, we don't have a dedicated gourmet products website but what we're doing is i'm building a truffle hill website which will be the proof of providence on the gourmet products it'll show it'll give the story it'll give the same story about the hunting of the truffle and all that that feed in the dirt sort of experience but it will also tell the story about where the honey comes from where the olive oil comes from so we're going to build the story as we've done. Everything we've done in the past has been based on a story. What I don't know is, I have a question for, this, for the or students involved in this is, what's, what sort of, is, am I, will, will the story resonate in what country with what people? Is the story the way to, to go? It's worked very well at high-end restaurants across the world. But will it work for gourmet products? So this is very much all greenfield because you're, you, Absolutely. you have in the retail sector. You've been ser yes. serving sort of a tiger and the chef. So it's, it's wide open for the students to come up with the ideas. Uh, it, it's like a yes. case study, blank case study for them. It's a blank case study, yes. Um, all the products you have, they're all available now. Like uh, David, who told me he's from Columbia, uh, is, the, uh, is the truffle juice being launched next month or is it already in the market? All your value added products, is it already available? Okay. Okay, the, 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 there will be a delay on the truffle juice. Um, we have it, it's ready, it's ready to be, be canned up now. Um, but um, we, uh, we're sitting back just not quite sure what to do with our next steps. We'll be doing some canning. Um, like the, the recipe was done by Chef Bombana, a Michelin star restaurant in, in Hong Kong. So he came to our farm and we developed the recipe while he was at our He's taken the original, he was going to take all of, all of, of the product, but with things which have happened in Hong Kong, that's obviously not going to be the case. So we will have an initial 500 cans, which will be by this year, we'll have 4,500 mil cans available. We're also looking at doing a, uh, a two litre uh, food service for chefs. But again, we're trying to, which we're stepping our way through this. We do not need to be, we do not have to hurry up with this. We have to get it right. So because everything can be canned, it's sterile. We've got a five year shelf life. I'm not gonna be hanging around for five years, but when we've, we've basically delayed the launch of a number of things of the, of the truffle jus, truffle jus is available for samples, but I need to, when we push, press the button on this, we want to make sure that we are, we are going to have everything stepped out, the production, logistics, the branding, and how it's delivered into market. Sue Jay asks, uh, are the truffle value added products only in Asia right now? Uh, and what percentage breakdown among the countries for the products, would you say? You know, okay, so at, at the moment, the major in the space of, um, well, from November last year to now, the number one market for us is Taiwan. Mm. It went from zero to being our largest market. They'll be taking they'll be taking twenty five percent just for themselves. The Australian market uh, that's gone very well. That's been very very resilient through this, exactly because people are using it as a in, in restaurants. Sorry, not not going to restaurants, but using cooking at home. 
Mm. So Australia would be taking probably 65%. And the balance is split. Vietnam is doing quite well. Uh, Malaysia's stopped. That's nothing. Singapore is an open slather for us. Uh, we haven't got anything happening there. So it's really the, the only two markets. Are, and Japan takes some jus. Um, mm. But we haven't. And we've done a... Uh, we've sent samples there for our truffle uh, ponzu dipping sauce we did a collaborative uh, dinner the other week with um, the abrolos fisherman crayfisherman um, crayfish sushi sashimi with um, truffle dipping truffle dip, uh, ponzu dipping sauce was absolutely the rock star of the night it was brilliant so the, so the students can get quite creative in trying to figure out uh um, not only the, the the market, but how to promote it, particularly on the promotion. You know how, how to get in there. Yes. And do something different. Yes. Okay. So I'll, I'll be adding. We've we've also just completed. Uh, we've had a, a young master chef here in Australia. Um, he's done a some more video for us, um, and we've had some more food photography. We've just been playing around with some concepts. I'm not averse to having uh, this. The whole thing. Of, uh, when we go, we'll go very strong. But we we've. This is Greenfield. So we're, we're having a little try at this and looking what that looks like. Uh, we're discussing with chefs. We're discussing with retailers. We're discussing with you guys. So it's, it's really, it's, it's pretty exciting. We, we, um, we would think that the, uh, the market in, in condiments is, as I said, is just huge. In Shanghai last year, the market for truffle, truffled oils was 17 million US. In Shanghai. Let me so ask you on China: uh, Is there a concern about China because of the uh, the political disputes with Australia and the holdup of uh, wine and barley and beef and uh, th that agriculture is uh, used? Um, look, uh, I, I won't make comment about geopolitical stuff, but when you do trade, you do trade. Sometimes you just have to be patient. So we're farmers. Mm -hmm. uh, I just consider, I, I look as a, in a simplistic way, I'd consider uh, this year to be a bad farming year. And next year we hope it's going to be a better farming year. But with my uh, people I've been in discussion with across the world in different places and certainly in China, we don't see, we don't see this as an end game in what's Australia Chinese current relationship because things just kings will move on. Uh, they will evolve. Uh, and I believe they'll work out how they work out where the balance of it all sits. I don't know, but it will work out because the world needs to keep moving forward. If it, if it all, if everyone if locks up, I think there were 128, someone said 128 anti-dumping things happening around the world at the moment. Uh, we're only talking about a couple which are at this stage affecting Australia and China. And I yeah. think if, uh, if business people and, and people involved in trade can uh, sit down and nut something out, well, it won't be this year. It might be a little bit later into next year, but it will work its way through. So we take the long game. China is on the table as far as we're concerned. We're spending, continuing to spend money, getting all our accreditations and such in place. And um, we'll work through on the assumption at some point, business will be back to being business. So is the focus entirely on a country in Asia, or let's say David in Colombia says, you know, he thinks it's a great opportunity to, to penetrate in Colombia. Uh, would you be open to that as a uh, consideration? Ab absolutely, absolutely. Um, th the things which we, we also, when we go into the country, is also the, the protocols in those countries. So if there is already a trade agreement, uh, free trade agreements already in place. If there are people who are already in in the game of of importing products from Australia or Australia New Zealand areas and into that, well then it's shown it can be done. What we find is really like when we took um, we took our fresh truffle into Vietnam two years ago. No one had taken fresh truffle into Vietnam. We had to work through the whole process and. There were no protocols in place. We had to help in develop the protocols to get our fresh truffle in. Whereas 
we could send our gourmet products straight away because there were already people taking a whole lot of dry goods and, and these sort of things into that country. So if there are, there are already uh, things in place and people are already bringing things in from a particular country, from Australia, well, then we can, we can look at doing that. Um, it's it's yeah. not a problem. Just to let the students know, if you have any other questions, uh, please, please uh, put them up. We have about a, probably another five minutes. Um, I know someone has asked that if you would go back in time, what would you do differently to enhance the success of the company? That's actually, that's a very good question. I, I, I look at this, but some of the great things that we've done or been able to achieve because have been as part of a, an honest misstep. So we learnt about things. One of the things that we've got the truffle and wine part of it. Wine is a legacy. We're going to try to build a, a, um, a, a brand of wine to sell to the truffles, alongside the truffles. The problem is that the chef runs the restaurant and in higher end restaurants, the song, the sommelier runs the wine purchasing. So you're having to do two pitches. You have to go to different people to actually make each individual sale. Hmm. So that's what we've, that's why when we look at our gourmet products, we're not going to the same distributors. We've actually got one of those at the moment, a legacy in where they were importing our products into Japan. Very, very good seller of wine. Doesn't do gourmet products. Well, he does them for us because he was not going to say no. It wasn't part, it was part of the, as a cultural thing, this was offered to him and he gave it respect and he tried to sell it through his channels. But it's, it hasn't been successful. When you look back at that, why wasn't it successful? It's not his main core business. It's not what he does. You need to find the right people, match it up with what you're trying to get through. And so one of the things we've learned and which I'm trying to get done with this project is to say the distribution of the gourmet products, the silent distribution is going to be totally different to the distribution of our fresh truffle. So that was a learning experience. Um, so, so you have COVID. Is, has that been your greatest challenge or has, has there been uh, something else that's been more significant for carrying your company forward? COVID was an interest, is an interesting one ongoing. We've just finished our fresh season. In May, we thought we would not be doing selling any fresh truffle overseas just because logistics chains have broken down. So to get us to New York, air freight out of Western Australia, uh, say freight was normally X, uh, freight costs were between eight and 14 X. So at that rate, we, we weren't going to make any money sending anything to New York, if New York, well, New York was open at that stage. What we've, what we've basically found, we've worked our way through the various logistics. And this year, we've only hunted to order for fresh truffle. Whereas more, we, 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 normally we'd be, everyone screaming for fresh truffle. We cannot, we've never had a situation where we've had an oversupply of truffle. Never. Hmm. This year, you can say we met the market. Um, but we were still able, we, we sold about 60% of what we would normally do overseas, predominantly into Asia. Um, I did into a couple of... Having a closer delivery chain certainly makes it... Uh, that's, uh, yeah. You, if you had the first jump, you were guaranteed you knew the flight was going to get there, jump one. So you're going to a hub, you're going to a Singapore, you're going into a Hong Kong. You did not know the reliability of the flights to your next point was, wasn't there. And a delay in one flight used to be, oh, that's two hours later, you can go on to another flight. No, the delay on that was 18 hours. And then that messed up at the other end as well. So when we were sending product this year for fresh truffle and sending um, a 10 kilo box might have about eight kilos of fresh truffle plus gel packs, chill gel packs and insulation. This year, we're only able to send about six and a half kilos of fresh truffle because we had to put more insulation and more gel packs to make sure the product arrived in the quality at that, at that time. So that, that was a bit of a challenge as well. I think of, you know, these, these knockdown, these uh, that downstream effects, for, you know, and uh, yes. particularly for fresh produce. Yeah. 
even getting our products, our gourmet products into Taiwan. Um, we had a situation once, uh, we, it's all going air freight. So instead of, we could not get a flight into, that was connecting out of Singapore at one stage. We're actually going, um, uh, was going Perth, Singapore, Singapore, Saigon, Saigon, Hong Kong. And, and it had to do with the flights that which are then going into Taiwan. And then we're able to go Perth, Brisbane, Brisbane, Tokyo, Tokyo, Taiwan. So you had all, so that, what happened one week <laughs> was what was going to happen the next week. Mm. Yeah. But so the I same guess, applies uh, for our quiet products. Just to, to wrap up, any advice for students doing your challenge? Everything's on the table. Whether you wish to look at some specific thing about the ad Pacific company, sorry, a particular country, whether you want to look at something, a particular product, or you want to have information about the whole product range, whether you wish to look at it as the food service, uh, whether you want to look at online sales, on the table. You want to look at our labels, make suggestions about our labels, or why we should keep the label as we are as opposed to change it, because you know, there's always people wanting things to change and perhaps our label needs a refresh for an overseas market. I'm not sure. Can you, can but, you have labels for different countries? What do you say? You, you can. Look, um, we don't, that'll come, that, that will affect the unit costs because if you can have, you want to be able to keep a consistency of your label, consistency of your brand. So unless you've got a, uh, a particular collaboration. So you're going to do something with a uh, an own brand with say something like uh, uh, Indaguna um, in um, Indaguna in, in Singapore. So we will end up with a, uh, a truffle hill Indaguna truffle jus or, or truffled honey as a collaboration. So someone comes to us and say, hey, I'll guarantee you X sales will do this, we'll badge it all up and we'll push it out as an exclusive offer. Um, or you might have something, again, the idea of, of uh, uh, particular types of labels in a particular country for a gifting proposal. So those are things which we would do. We, we look at collaborations. We'd like to be able to make sure our label's out at front and centre. So we're building our brand, our brand presence. So, and we want people to be able to be able to circle back and see the providence and our story within our website and our, our media. So, yep, everything's on the table. Well, thank you, Michael. I think this is uh, quite an interesting uh, challenge for the students. The, the, the product that you have, Truffle, being, being a, a higher end position type product, but you know, mass market, I mean, the, the, the middle market can also, and, the, and Asia, is one of is the largest uh, uh, middle consumer market in the world, and you have a good wealth segment in, in it as well. Um, yeah, you have you know four point six billion people. You got a, a good potential market up there. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I, on, on behalf of X Culture, I just want to thank you for. I know this does take time on your business. I would ask students to uh, when you have questions. You, you know, you can see poor Michael. He's there alone in his office. Don't overwhelm <laughs> emails. Send the email to the uh, X Culture team uh, because some of the uh, questions will overlap. And so, rather than Michael getting th you know 30, 40 emails uh, of which you know 20 of them are all the same, uh, we'll cover it off at, at X Culture uh, through the team and get back to you. So just go directly to the uh, X Culture link. Yeah, uh, yeah. And looking up uh, Michael's address. <laughs> Yes, what Mass. we do is we create a catalog of the most frequently asked questions. And so most of the questions are repetitive. So if it's the second time we hear the same question, we just copy and paste the answer. But if it's a new one that we don't know the answer to, then we may reach out to Michael and um, get more information and then add it to the catalog. So in the future, we don't have to bother busy executives with the same questions. Okay. I'm um, looking at one last question here. Are you opening to, are you open to uh, white labeling your product under an already uh, uh, famous local brand? Uh, we would be open to that. Okay. Yes. Okay. 
Okay. Well, thank you, Michael. Enjoy uh, yourself in, uh, in Western Australia. Uh, you guys are, I think, free of cases. Um, so you can wander around and go to the pub. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're, we're pretty lucky here in Western Australia at the moment. Uh, we're a long way from a lot of places and that's worked in our favour in this. It's, and it's, it's uh, one of those things, you, we got lucky. Yeah. Um, but we're, we're certainly not uh, accepting that luck on, you know, on, on space value to think that we're just special, but we've, we've got to keep an eye out and wish everyone the best and um, best of health and, and everyone stay safe. Okay. Thank you, Michael. All the best. And uh, in a couple, a couple of months, you will have uh, be inundated with reports to read. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much, Gordon. Then... Thanks very much, Beth. Yes, thank you. I'll post the recording also for the students who could not attend due to the strange timing, so uh, time zone differences, but um, they will watch it tomorrow, day after tomorrow. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. thank you. So, Vas, you're going to... Uh, yeah, yeah uh, I'm going to... ...this and then start up the next one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks.